Hi, I'm Chin Lu. And I'm Sal. And this is Our Next Make. We're back in the shop again doing another awesome upgrade. That's right, we're finally going to give the miter saw the attention that it needs. For decades, I've been using this saw on any surface that would hold it. So we're finally going to give it proper material support and awesome dust collection. And side benefit, I get to reclaim this cedar cabinet for a future project. So let's get started. I wanted to jump right into SolidWorks to start modeling my ideas, but first I needed to grab a few key dimensions from the miter saw so I could make sure it would fit. I'm using an old school technique here where I'm tracing the saw on some craft paper and transferring marks of the saw in various positions so I can see where the dust port would land. This will be particularly useful when I design the dust collection solution. With this information in hand, I could confidently design the miter station. It's made up of two main pieces, a series of seven legs that mount to the wall and a large torsion box that is the work surface. It has an upper and a lower skin, four sides, and a series of ribs on the inside. This design creates an incredibly stiff and lightweight structure. To build it, I break down full sheets of plywood using a combination of a circular saw with a homemade track and the table saw. In the past, I'd always place foam under a sheet of plywood and cut it on the floor. But just before starting this project, I saw a video from Jay Bates about these infeed support legs. So I just had to make a pair and try them out. They work great and make ripping a full sheet like this much easier and safer. You do of course still need to take your time and be in full control of the sheet. And you need proper outfeed support too. For cross cuts that are four feet or less, I still use my homemade track and my circular saw. For this project, I cut the legs slightly oversized and then ran them through the table saw to hit the final width. Then I started laying out the notches and the inclined faces. I got most of my measurements from the SOLIDWORKS drawing that I printed out, but I forgot to include one dimension. So I grabbed my phone, opened the 3D model, and took a quick measurement. Having my SOLIDWORKS data on the cloud means it's always with me no matter where I am. After making the first cut, I flipped the piece around and clamped it to the off cut. That way I could cut two parts at once. I kept the parts clamped together while I used the jigsaw to cut the notches. This made quick work of the seven legs, so I started to lay out the front of the torsion box. This is the piece that has recesses in it for the miter saw and the drill press. I cut all of the details using the jigsaw. I find that you can achieve great results with a sharp blade and a steady hand. I used the same approach to cut the slot shaped opening for the drill press, as well as the opening for the dust collection. In this case, I drilled a pilot hole first and then followed the lines I drew. To cut the spacers to length, I set up a fence and a stop block at the miter saw. This of course worked well, and it's how I've made repeat cuts like this for years. But truth be told, I'm glad this is the last time I'll have to use a system like this. With all the pieces cut, I could turn my attention to drilling the pocket screw holes. Up until this project, I only had a small portable pocket hole jig, but since this one had over 100 holes to drill, I made the investment in this larger Craig jig. For me, the amount of time this saved and the awesome dust collection makes it totally worth the money. In fact, it's this approach that's helped me grow my tool collection over time. Each time I tackle a new project, I decide if that project and future ones like it will benefit from a new tool. If so, I factor in the tool's cost and make my decision. With all of the pieces prepared, I spent a few minutes working on some final details. I sanded all of the parts that will end up on the outside of the final build, and then I cut a few biscuit slots to help align the front and back pieces of the torsion box. Of course, you could use dowels or dominoes here if you don't have a biscuit joiner, but I do think something is needed to help align and strengthen this butt joint. I also took a minute to mask off the areas where I'll later glue on maple trim. I used simple painter's tape and a sharp utility knife to trim it to size. Then I turned my attention to priming and painting all the visible surfaces. I laid a tarp down to protect my garage floor and placed scraps underneath each piece to raise them off the ground. I also set up a makeshift jig that allowed me to paint both sides of the legs at once. When I finished painting one, I would screw it to a few boards clamped between my roller stands so it could dry without taking up much floor space. I mostly used a roller to apply the primer, but I used a brush to get at areas that it couldn't reach. When the primer was dry, I brushed on two coats of red paint to match the other painted pieces in the shop. I tend to prefer a brush finish over a rolled finish for projects like this. To start assembling the torsion box, we place the first piece of the top upside down on a flat surface and attach the section of the back. We took our time here to get our offsets just right and to make sure everything was square and flush. This set us up nicely for the rest of the build. We took the same care when placing the right side of the box. We used several squares to make sure the piece was in the perfect position and then glued and screwed it into place. From this point on, we could work our way down the line gluing and screwing ribs. After halfway through the build, we came to the recess for the miter saw. In this section, we had to jump an air gap in the top, so we carefully positioned the second piece and temporarily used the bottom of the box to help align everything. 
Once we were happy with the layout, we glued in the alignment biscuits and then screwed the next section of the back in place. At this point, we also added thin strips of plywood to the underside of the top to give us more meat to screw into when we recess out for the T-tracks in the future. We used scraps as a spacer to keep the strips a consistent distance off of the front and then applied a bit of glue to the pieces before driving in a few brad nails to clamp things while the glue set. After a while, we got into a groove as we worked our way down to the far end of the build. We would alternate gluing and screwing a rib and then gluing and nailing a T-track backer. Since the box was hanging off the end of our table, we fine-tuned the height of a roller stand to support it and used a few clamps to keep the top tight up against the front and back rails. We wrapped up this part of the frame by attaching the last piece of the back and the left side. This is what the assembly looked like so far. To finish up the torsion box, we screwed on the bottom. We used 3 quarter plywood here too, because that's what we had on hand. But you can get away with half inch material and reduce the overall weight. In fact, that's the beauty of a torsion box. It gets its strength more from its shape than from the thickness of the material. With the box complete, we could start mounting the legs to the knee wall. I used a level to mark plumb lines at all the right locations and then screwed in the first leg. Shimming where necessary, we leveled the next leg relative to the first and then proceeded to do the same down the line. I should point out here that the knee wall is 3 quarter inch plywood, so I can attach anywhere. If you have a stud wall or some other surface, do make sure you're screwing into solid material. At 14 and a half feet long, you'd think this would be heavy and awkward, but it was remarkably easy to maneuver. We stood it up on its back, slid it off the table onto roller stands, and then pivoted it into place. Once everything was aligned, we lowered the roller stands and things slid into position. It only took a little bit of persuasion to fully see the top onto the legs. That was a moment worthy of a mini celebration. And it was a time to reflect on how different the result is from our initial idea. We actually changed our minds three times before we landed on this design. But because our SOLIDWORKS for Makers license has no hassle data management built right in, we could create revisions of our ideas with the click of a button. You can see here that our previous idea had the drill press much closer to the miter saw. And all through a web browser, we could easily open our designs in a viewer to take a closer look and discuss which one we liked best. We could even compare two ideas by overlaying one atop the other. You can see here that our very first idea in orange didn't even have a recess for the drill press. It's great that we were able to try out a bunch of new ideas before ever buying any material. Especially given the price of plywood and hardwood like maple that we use for the trim. I ripped 3 quarter inch maple into inch and a half strips and worked my way around the station cutting one miter at a time. For specialty cuts like this one where I needed to notch the miter, I used the bandsaw, but all the other cuts were done with a miter sled on the table saw. I'd cut one under the miter, mark it in situ, and then creep up on the perfect fit. To attach the trim, I cut biscuit slots along the outside of the top and then cut matching slots in the maple pieces. When doing glue ups like this, I like to do a dry fit, not only to make sure everything goes together as planned, but also to act as a jig. I leave everything clamped in place and only remove one piece at a time. That way when I glue it in place, I can perfectly match the miters with the other pieces. In closed spaces where clamps won't fit, I apply a bit of pressure by tightly stretching painter's tape over the piece. This provides enough force to hold it in place while the glue dries. We worked our way around the top, gluing and clamping as we went and then let things set up overnight. The next day, we cut a large laminate sheet into smaller, more manageable pieces. We set up on some sawhorses and used a jigsaw to make the cuts, but it was a bit awkward. I think the next time we do this, we'll set up on a sheet of foam on the floor and cut it with a circular saw. We then applied contact cement to the plywood top of the torsion box, as well as the underside of the laminate. We did find that the plywood soaked up the adhesive quite a bit, so we ended up applying a second layer before attaching the pieces. If you've never worked with contact cement before, please read the label and be careful. This stuff's no joke. It's highly flammable and the vapors are nasty. We waited until a nice warm day so we could have the garage windows and doors wide open, and we had three fans going to push the air outside. We also wore carbon filters in our RZ masks. The good news is, once the material sets up, the aroma goes away, so working in the space afterward is actually quite nice. Once the pieces were tacky, we spread a few spacer strips across the surface and then positioned the laminate. We removed one spacer at a time and then used a J-roller to apply even pressure across the whole surface. This creates an immediate and permanent bond. It's really quite cool. And you can continue working with the material right away. I used a flush trim bit and my plunge router to trim off the excess and reveal the drill press recess. Then I switched over to a chamfering bit to ease the edges and reveal a bit more of the maple. To chamfer the tight spots, I switched over to my palm router and attacked it from the front instead of the top. All that was left was to apply finish to the maple. 
I quickly sanded with 150 grit and then 220 before applying a few coats of water-based polycrylic. It's easy to apply and to clean up, and although it's not as tough as polyurethane, I like it for this type of application. I'm so excited that the miter saw finally has a proper home in the shop. And I'm glad we got to include the drill press into the design. And with this setup, we're gonna have safer and more accurate cuts. Yeah. Now there's a lot more we still have to do. We're gonna install T-tracks and a ruler. We're also gonna focus on dust collection, but we'll do that in a future episode. And if this inspired you to do some upgrades to your own workspace, please tell us about it in the comments. Until then, we'll see you on our next make.